I want to um, share a talk today and what I want to talk about are, are several things but firstly I want to talk about no mud, no lotus no difficulties, no catastrophe, no opposition, no argument. We cannot find the Dharma. We cannot find the truth. It was why the Buddha said to be born as a human was the most acceptable and easiest way for liberation because we have in our life the mud all of us have it I've had a fair dose this last few months from several levers and also I have seen the heavens the bliss the beauty it is never one sided in our existence when we think of the mud when I think of the lotus and the mud I'm reminded in my home temple in Korea in Songkwangsa when you entered the big communal toilet down in the main temple which I didn't go to that often unless I was in the main temple but everyone in the temple went there and at the entrance is this magnificent lotus pond quite ironic really because you know in one part of that little area you're alleviating and <laughs> giving the fodder to produce <laughs> the fertilization for the pond and in another you're looking at this beautiful lotus the buds and the, the formation of these big white lotuses they're all white coming out of this pool you might say no mud no water too but only for a short time the lotus life when we think of 12 months of the year the life of the lotus is a little more than half a month maybe a month if you're lucky and the rest you are seeing either in this case the ice across the, <laughs> the lotus pond with a few stalks hanging out of it in winter the decaying mud as spring comes a few fresh stalks and green leaves then the lotus and then again the decay it is life and it is death But an interesting thing for me this last uh, few months is through some difficulties that I was having both in my mind and in my body, there was a struggle. And we have a lot of struggles in our Dharma realms, you know, there's the chaos and crumbling of cultures even the Dhamma and when the there is crumbling and chaos within the monastic realms or within traditions there is merging to try and hold them together the monks and nuns in a certain time they start to create their own uh, what you can say their own rules and their own ways to keep a tradition alive. I had a little argument 
around uh, some procedures that were going to take place. I won't get into the depth of this, but from my tradition, I have to uphold, as we all uphold our traditions and our cultures. From my tradition, it has a lineage. The Vinaya has a lineage. We call it a, you know, it is like uh, the blood of that lineage is, is imparted from generation to generation. The culture has a, a lineage of continuing. From time to time they do merge, they do interact. But in this case I didn't think it was so necessary. Our cultures are still alive. Our traditions are, are quite flourishing at the moment, as you see in Newbury. So this created a, a bit of an inner turmoil, partially the little argument, partially my own dogmatic beliefs about certain things, and in part the separations, the alienations that come from it. When a family has a conflict, a mother to a child, what happens? The children run away and the parents feel sorrow. This is all part of the separation that happens as a natural process of change and decay occur. It is a very important part of the process. Anyone who is a parent here know that. To allow the children to become more independent it is so important to have the capacity to let go, to allow their generational thinking to be different, and that's okay. They challenge us, and they make us think. We don't always agree, but as you get older, there is an interesting thing that happens. We start to actually respond in a way to these changes and challenges that is an opening and a freeing, a little bit like that lotus that comes and expands and opens and allows everything to enter. If we do not have that in our capacity, and we grasp to our dogmas and our traditions, we grasp to our beliefs, then in that narrowing, we become frightened, agitated, fearful, and lonely. I remember once in Songwangsa many years ago, someone up in the hierarchy decided to sell off some of the land of the temple. There wasn't a discussion about it. The monastic weren't called in to, to discuss it. It just happened. And we were at that time very agitated. You know, there were lots of discussions and the monks were, you know, had a lot to say about it and disagree with it. And the agitation was very forthcoming. How dare they? This is temple land. This is monastic land. And I was a young nun, so I wasn't part born in this culture. I wasn't so passionate about what was mine or theirs. But still I got caught up in this this agitation for a short time and then something quite interesting happened. I had a reflection and the reflection was before this there was nothing. You know we rarely think of that. We always think before this there was that and that and that but actually that and that and that 
is only our recollection of it, is only our knowledge. Yes, we have experienced it and in some level it is within who we are now. But the actual thing itself, that actual parcel of land, which may have been donated to the temple centuries ago, it may have not even been noticed by the monastic. I didn't really know it. I mean, I'd walked across it, but I didn't probably know it was part of the temple because the temple land is so vast. But more than that, before it became an argument, it was nothing to me. It was not good or bad, an issue. It wasn't a possession I owned. And in that came enormous sense of letting go. I could then step back and watch the argument conti continue with some sort of, until it faded out of course, people forgot and moved on. But for that short period of time, I could step out of it. It was not me, it was not mine. Just as a lotus is not me, it is not mine. It has its conditions. But it does need that mud. It does need that problem before insight arises. Insights are quite rare, real insights. I mean, I could probably count the real insights over 20 years in Korea, the real ones, on a hand. Many of you, in a lifetime, you can look back and say, wow, I really learned something. It's usually in some very difficult situation, a death, a divorce, where we go through a grieving, a relinquishing, and a growing. There is, uh, well, I was uh, resting, you know, and I'd, I'd be resting for a f half an hour, an hour, and then I'd get up and do a little bit for an hour, as you do when you're sick. And I live in, off in the mountains, so I didn't tell many people about this. I had a little bit of illness last year, and I just thought, oh, you know, just need rest. Actually, I had some sort of virus, which they didn't know, still don't know, but I'm better now. And with this rest comes a great opportunity for reflection. So I was able to reflect on that situation. I was having a, a cultural, traditional, passionate view about. And I was able to give it space and reflect on the other concerns the other party and their interests. Not that it makes it right, or I'm right, or they're wrong. It's not about that. It's about opening up to an understanding. And in this reflection also came the opening up to the experience of the, the processes going on in this body. It always takes an illness or something for us to stop and really be with our pain. You know, how many of us keep walking when our legs can barely move? Keep going because, you know, if we stop, <laughs> we may not do it. All of us know that. We thrive and push ourselves. But when we're forced to stop, then we usually go inward. And I could see in this body, as certain thoughts arose, so did certain agitations, certain experiences and feelings. 
and pain. When those thoughts alleviated, so too the physical. I remember once my teacher, when he was a young monk, was going to a retreat with a good friend. And he was incredibly sick. The two had left the temple. He'd run away from his duties to look after his teacher. As you do as young monastic, you're just so fervent. I have to go and become enlightened. And on the way, he was so sick. He stopped at a, at a temple. And at that time, these married priests were running a lot of the temples. They weren't monks, but they were a priest with families. And so for the celibate monks, like my teacher and others, they couldn't stay there more than one night. So he knew he had one night. And when he was laying with his pain and suffering, he started to look into the roots of it. You know, what is this? What is this thing I call my body? Where is this pain, this thing I call pain coming from? What does it feel like? What does it look like? What is it? And as he would go into it, each of the discomforts, they would disappear. Because his mind was also very sharp. So by the morning, his illness had run away. And he got up and continued on his path to catch up with his friend to do this long retreat. In that retreat, and I've talked about this and I won't go into it today, it was his friend who died. His friend ate some noodles and got indigestion. At a time, they couldn't get a doctor. And so these two Dharma friends made a pact. If I pass away, then you must practice very hard and become enlightened so you can save me too. And if I live, then I too will dedicate this life to one thing, to awakening. It was the impetus that brought my teacher to practice so hard. It is said he stood on his balls of his feet, so stood up on the top of his feet for a week with his hands in prayer. Even the 49th day ceremony came and he didn't come down. He only would come down to have a, one meal a day. But he felt he was not enlightened, so he couldn't stop. He kept his meditation. If he didn't practice in this way, he said he got sleepy, he got tired. So he found a form, a very difficult form, to practice with his body. Very few of us can do that. To push ourselves in that way. But, through that time, he talked about this mud, this confusion, this fear, this pain he had for his friend's passing. This went round in his thoughts until he had a few moments where he could let go completely. And there he awakened, had his first great insight great understanding. He said, time went backwards. The morning we would get up at three in the morning and the clock goes dong. All meditation halls where we sit and sleep and eat have a big clock and the clock would go dong, dong. You'd hear it all through the night, you know, from nine o'clock. You'd hear then the ten dongs, the eleven dongs, the twelve dongs. <laughs> you sort of never really go into complete sleep. And he said, when it got to three, instead of going one, dong, dong, the third dong stopped and went backwards. It went into that place that 
I mentioned a moment ago. Prior this, there is nothing. It's not an emptiness of negation, an emptiness of nothing. It's an emptiness where everything merges into that moment and exists in completeness, fulfillment. And so there is a, another little story here that I want to share. It's from a, a Zen teaching. There was a famous Zen nun who used to have herself and all the nuns sit in front of a mirror to meditate. It was called the mi mirror mind meditation. The mind mirror, mirror mind. Mirror mind is where the mind becomes like a mirror. It reflects everything that enters. That's only just like a mirror. When we look into a mirror and we see ourselves, that's all there is. And they would sit there in front of the mirror, looking deeply into this mirror and asking, in this mirror, where is this feeling? Where is this body? Where is this thoughts? Where is this self? That was their meditation. A little bit like when I was resting with my illness. Where is this pain? Where does it come from? Of course, most of it comes from the mind. Just for a moment now, I want you to just recognize where you're sitting and where your own discomforts are. You don't have to create a position. But what is it you're feeling? Where is your mind, your thoughts? Are they present here or are you thinking about what you're going to do when you leave here? All the things you've said you'll do for the day. Are you trying to have an experience? A little moment of epiphany? Or are you just able to just be there? In this moment you notice some weight in your body, or your feet on the ground. Notice your thoughts coming and going. So what is happening for you just right now? Why I wanted you to engage in this. It's what's happening even while I'm talking. Whether the talk is of interest or not. You will make it interesting because your mind will go somewhere else and engage in something else. Or you might bliss out, find it's a peaceful environment, so let's have a little peace this morning. A lot of people come to meditation talks to have a little bit of bliss. It's interesting, there's a story about the Buddha who ended up in the inn with a man who had been talking to his friends, who was also staying in the inn and talking to his friends about the Buddha and his teachings. And the Buddha didn't declare he's the Buddha. When he sat down to talk to this man, he asked who he was, and where he came from, and he asked him if he has any 
practice or any teaching that he likes to follow. And he said, oh yes, I follow the Buddha. I mean, quite often this is, I have people come to my door, oh yes, I, I'm a good Buddhist. <laughs> that can mean anything. But the Buddha is a very insightful person. So he doesn't, uh, he doesn't, t you know, disclose he is the Buddha and he doesn't disclose anything. He just asks him, well, what do you think Buddhism is? What is Buddhism? And the man says, oh, you know, Buddhism takes you to bliss in this life and in the next an everlasting bliss. The beautiful places and you stay in this bliss forevermore. The Buddha goes, oh. It's a very long story really, but eventually the Buddha is having this discussion and trying to say, well, I don't think that's really the Buddha's true teachings. Because if that were the case, we would just be de developing more craving in this life for that bliss, for that peace. We would try to be growing lotuses in the sky. But actually, you were kept saying, kept arguing, no, no, you know, the Buddha is about us having peace and joy and happiness and fulfillment and everything. And the Buddha's saying, well, you know, even if you get all that, I'm not sure that's going to bring you liberation or freedom or truth. That might just make you crave a lot more and grasp at these ideas. It's not a real reality. Eventually, the story goes on, he makes it known he is the Buddha. <laughs> and by this time, a man is ready to really listen. And the interesting thing was, when he asked the Buddha, and this happens in many discussions with the Buddha, well, what happens if you become enlightened once you pass away? The Buddha keeps quite silent. He says, gives a few hints. In that, in another discourse, it's not about, it's not that we don't have or do have. When he asks, you know, do you still have the suffering or the conditions that make us human. And the Buddha is quite careful in negating this argument. So he doesn't put a position on having or not having. Is the Buddha beyond? Again, the Buddha doesn't put a position on this or that. Because if we try to think of what a Buddha and his enlightenment is, it is beyond our conceptions, beyond our thoughts beyond our limited perceptions of this, our limited human conditioning to understand. So he doesn't take us there in a fantasy of what it is like to become enlightened. He doesn't take us into the craving for bliss. The lotus isn't about just the beauty, the perfection, the purity. It is also about its demise passing away and what it returns to. On out of that, what is reborn or born? It is the whole cycle of what comes into existence, what shines, what shows itself in its fullness and what passes away and where does it go? Thich Nhat Hanh always gives a lovely analogy when he talks about the leaf as it withers and it falls to the ground, how it becomes the fertilizer or the mother 
that gives nourishment to the roots of the tree. Now if we could go back again in the story, whatever it is we are doing, there is this cyclic situation where something out of conditions, out of the chain of effects arises, stays a while and passes away. But it never actually vanishes. It's always in a state of becoming. And that point about before this there is nothing. That is quite a Zen way of talking actually, but before this it is not what we think it was before because the thinking is very limited. The recall is very limited because it always wants to recall in a certain light of memory. But actually in its process of becoming or in our recall which is in the present all our memory, it's always now whatever it is we think is happening is not in the past or the future, it's always now in its becoming if it's become it's gone and it is in this capacity you know the flower is always in its becoming to become its fullest and then it's in its becoming of its demise and the becoming of its fertilization in which it becomes many things. Interesting, you know, what is fertilization? It has so many organic matter and beings, millions of little beings that are breaking up the processes within and without. I want to share another part of this story of this last couple of months, which is a little bit the, you know, right the t last week actually, the last couple of weeks. So I was just starting to get better, just starting to come to the acceptance of what is regarding my earlier conflict, stepping out of it, allowing the processes to take their place, knowing the people engaged are well informed, not by me, but by others. Not only by me, I should say, but by others. To make choices. That is all we can do. Is to inform and allow people to discover and make choices. And so I pulled right out of all of this. You know, why my illness, what is about? It didn't matter anymore. In recovery, we tend to move on quickly. But just at the end, we have this massive family wedding. I thought family weddings was, you know, the few I've been to and the few I've given blessings to. Sort of an afternoon, evening affair. You know, you go and shake hands with a few people and sit down and, you know, I always have an excuse to leave early. Well, not in this one. This has been planned for, I think, a year. They wanted three days of all the families from all over the world to converge in Melbourne, of which half of them came to stay with me. And a three-day event, you know, a th three-day drinking and eating fest. And for young ones, after the third day, I tell you, they're, if they're not alcoholic before, they're all alcoholic afterwards. <laughs> I mean, indeed, the beauty and the splendor and, you know, wonderful, lovely young couple. I mean, spectacular looking young, young couple. You know, perhaps as bridal dresses, which I've never worn one, so I don't know, go. <laughs> or they did like my regalia, so. <laughs> there was a little competition there. <laughs> she looked stunning. He looked stunning. And the weather. The one day out of nearly two months 
of no rain. It's promising, 90% rain. Well, all the prayers went out a week before. <laughs> and the rain we could see reducing, 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 till it was only going to be, you know, half, half an inch or something, or half, a few centimetres. And it had gone from going to be inside this beautiful venue that looks out over the Yarra Valley to they really wanted to do it outside. And so the groom left it to the last moment to make the decision and everything got moved outside. It was a little bit of mist, yes, we could deal with that. And I was sort of sitting there doing some Deva blessings. <laughs> please <laughs> hold the rain off for another half an hour, please. <laughs> and then I did my little blessing. I, they asked me to do a blessing. And I did my blessing and it started to rain. <laughs> So everybody had to come in. It was almost like, we, gee, we wish we hadn't asked her to do the blessing. <laughs> so we all came in. By this time, where they were originally going to do it in this beautiful room which was set up, that had been all set up for the food. And so the, the wedding got cornered around a veranda. Still the, the, the remaining part, which were the vows and so forth, was on the veranda. And I watched, I didn't stay so late and I had the great opportunity to have an excuse to take the elderly family members or the young ones back to where they were staying, <laughs> which became a little bit of coming and going. But I watched, and this you would know more than me because I don't go to these events very often, <laughs> is you watch how everybody comes absolutely looking their best. You know, they've spent a long time having their hair done and their makeup put on. And they come to the wedding looking beautiful. You know, I'm saying, oh, you look very beautiful. Oh, they're so happy when I say that. And then <laughs> you suddenly start watching it as the dancing happens and the, the drinking goes on. <laughs> the looks change, you know. So the lotus has certainly had its full bloom somewhere in there. <laughs> And the withering is having a rather quick effect as the night goes on. <laughs> well, I can tell you, by the, th the third day, everybody was really, you know, had eaten more than they would eat in a month and the rest of it, and re very ready to go home. I lived quite close, so I was able to come and go. But... Uh, for many of them, when family all come together for a long period, as much as they love each other for a day or two, when they're all in a house together and they don't normally see each other, you know, once in every few years or so, when they're all in a house together, it's a very loud environment, you know. And the boys are all, you know, prying for attention and the women are all in the kitchen. So there was much of this unfolding and decomposing to observe as there is in our life in our everyday family life we are very focused on the moment of bliss the meditation retreat the little bit of peace we get coming to our Sunday gatherings but much of our life is the state of digestion, replenishing, decomposing, reflecting. Much of our life is spent in understanding what it is all about, trying to understand. And the thing that glues it together, the thing that pulls it into this moment is that capacity to be with. The capacity to be still enough, open enough, honest enough. Even honesty, we don't have to be direct and rude. unless really required, 
But generally, you know, we can be all these things if we hold true to ourselves. This is what the Buddha is asking. What is truth? Who are you? Who are you really? What is it to be a, a human, a good human, a kind human, a loving human, a caring human? When we hold this, in our heart, then all these other things can be there too. The chaos, the catastrophes. Because it's only from that place can we respond in the appropriate way. That is helpful in those situations. It's the only place we can really be who we are fully, we can really flower and offer that presence that guides the situation. So coming back to that point, without the mud there is no lotus. Without this samsara there is no Buddha. Without the difficulties in our life, there is no capacity for us to gain great insight and the freedom to allow things to be. Doesn't mean not engaging, but it gives us the capacity to have wisdom to know how to engage and how to really be helpful. <laughs>